One year later, Kyiv stands, and Ukraine stands. Democracy stands. Since Russia invaded Ukraine, the domestic argument has been over the Eastern European countries' importance or significance for the United States. Is this really our war? He doubts our staying power. He doubts our continued support for Ukraine. He doubts whether NATO can remain unified. Today, the tectonic plates of global power are shifting with the autocratic alliance of China, Russia, and Iran no longer content to accept the status quo of an indefinite standoff between competing ideologies and commercial interests. They started the war and we used force to stop it. They have decided to make Ukraine a singular test, which they believe the U.S., Europe, and Asia's democracies will ultimately fail. The elites of the West want to turn a local conflict into a global confrontation. I'm not predicting World War III, at least not as conventionally understood. This new alliance of two significant nuclear powers and Iran on the brink seems at least to recognize that the self-destruction of nuclear war means they have to win this war on a series of conventional fronts, such as Ukraine, Taiwan, the Baltics, or Syria. Following China's belligerent reaction to the U.S. shooting down of a spy balloon, initially spotted near a nuclear base in Montana, Chinese leader Xi Jinping is planning to visit Moscow in the spring. China wants us to believe that Mr. Xi will use the visit to push Vladimir Putin towards a peace settlement. More credible is this assertion by the U.S. Secretary of State. We have information that gives us concern that they are considering providing lethal support to Russia in, uh, in the war against Ukraine. And it was important for me to share very clearly with, with Wang Yi uh, that this would be a serious problem. Should China help arm Russia, they would be joining Iran as an active enabler of Mr. Putin's long war. The United States needs Poland and NATO as much as NATO needs the United States. As in the past, when an alliance of adversaries has turned more aggressive, some Republicans have rediscovered the century-old belief that the United States can insulate itself from the tides of history. I think it would behoove them to identify what is the strategic objective that they're trying to to achieve, uh, but just saying it's an open-ended blank check, uh, that is not acceptable. A political realist would view Mr. DeSantis' statements on Ukraine as mainly an attempt to peel off more of the Trump base. And like some of the other neo-isolationists in Congress, he did add this distinction without a difference. So I think Russia has been really, really wounded here, um, and I don't think that they are the same threat to our country. Even though they're hostile, mm-hmm. I don't think they're on the same level as a China. The bet being made in Moscow and Beijing is that their will to win can eventually cause American and European leadership to break. That win isn't about merely defeating the Ukrainians. It's about finally proving to the other nations these two have been courting in Asia, the Middle East, Latin America, and in resource-rich Africa, that the time has arrived to join the world's winners and pull back from the losers. We cannot allow Russia to continue to chip away at European security. Make no mistake, we are in fragile territory. If several Republican presidential candidates or Germany and France look willing to finally abandon the Ukrainians, the same calculation about who's winning will be made in India, Australia, Japan, and South Korea. An attack against one is attack against all. The U.S.'s strategic objective in Ukraine is to prevent Russia, China, and Iran from being able to declare persuasively to the world that they are winning. Only one nation, Ukraine, is actively fighting to stop that from happening. Ukraine just needs the necessary instruments of war to do it, not next summer, but right now.